the indigenous languages and understandings of the region. And this is in line with what happened with the Swahilis, who developed a, a culture based upon Arab merchants who were coming into East Africa and intermarrying with the indigenous people of East Africa. In this case, we have um, uh, slaves and political prisoners who are coming from the East, coming from Indonesia and Malaysia, from Sri Lanka, from Madagascar, from East Africa, and even from West Africa, all coming into the Cape, and they are being controlled by the Dutch. They are also living within South Africa, and the leading uh, or the major indigenous group are the Khoi Khoi uh, people. And um, so their language, the indigenous language, now mixes um, with Malaysian languages and then mixes with the Dutch language. And from out of this comes a, a new language. And um, this Dutch-based language is called Afrikaans. And so um, basically what it is is a Creole form of uh, a Dutch, but there is so much influence from Malaysian uh, languages uh, and, and some touches of Khoi Khoi also that um, it takes on a new form. And what is interesting about Afrikaans is that um, it is expressed by the people uh, in a local way and also it is written in the Arabic script. So that what we are finding is that um, in the same way that in uh, Al Andalus, that Spanish was written in Arabic script, also in West Africa, we find that Mandinka languages, the Songhai language, the Fulani language, Wolof, the languages of the Tawarek, are also written in the Arabic language. We find that Persian is expressed through the Arabic language. Turkish is expressed through the Arabic language. So we find that Arabic becomes a lingua franca. It becomes a language of education, a language of culture, a language of even transmitting uh, non-Arabic expressions. This is a powerful testimony to this language. And at that point in history, Arabic was still dominating much of the world. Muslims were the first to write Afrikaans in Arabic script. And so um, the early expressions of Afrikaans are coming out within Islamic texts. So we find, for instance, books on Aqidah, on faith, books on is, uh, grammar of Arabic, on uh, interpretation of the Qur'an, on the traditions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They are written in um, Afrikaans, but it's an Arabic script. So these textbooks actually now are considered to be um, one of the most important aspects of the written uh, heritage of Southern Africa. And it, it is now being uh, brought together in the African Union to, to make part of the rich culture of the African continent, which brought together people from different continents and different languages. And again, it is so interesting that Arabic uh, is at the basis of this. And Muslims are the agents of uh, bringing together different nationalities and also raising education to a high level within society. So this uh, young Muslim community living in the bondage of slavery then becomes liberated when slavery is abolished. But following this, a uh, terrible period of colonialism is developed in South Africa, which eventually leads into what is known as apartheid. And that is where people are separated based upon their color and based upon their nationalities. And so within the apartheid system, the white complexion people live in a separate area. They live on the high grounds and they get the best area. The middle people, called the coloreds, the people who are mixed, are living in the middle regions and they usually work as artisans and they work as domestics and some semi-skilled uh, jobs. And the African people are living on the bottom and are working in the gold mines and the diamond mines and the most menial jobs within the society itself. 
Muslims find themselves in the middle. They find themselves not in the top dominating classes and not in the lowest, most oppressed class. But they were oppressed and put into a very strategic position. So many of the Muslims were involved in the struggle against apartheid. They used their, uh, their, their education, they used their, their, their intelligence to try to bring the oppressed people from out of a state of oppression. From the time of Tuan Gudu, you go back to the 18th century, and even before that, to the time of Sheikh Yusuf Maqassa, back in the 17th century, Muslims were providing upward mobility through Islam. That people who did not know how to express themselves uh, through written languages, could not read uh, textbooks carrying science and literature, were introduced to writing through the Arabic language. Through the reading of the Qur'an, they were able to then go into uh, the revelation. They were able to learn the sayings of the great ulama who came out of the Middle East and out of much of Africa. And so Muslims provided this upward mobility for the oppressed people through the religion of Islam and through the learning of Arabic and the memorization of the Qur'an and the great writings of the ulama who uh, came from all parts of the Muslim world. The Cape Muslims were able to travel uh, out of South Africa, and it is reported that uh, from way back in the 18th century, some of them managed to actually reach Arabia, and they made pilgrimage to, make to, to Arabia. So from the 18th century into the 19th century, they had a term they called the Muslims of the Cape Ahlul Kahf, which we would know as the people of the cave. And there's a chapter called Surat al-Kahf, uh, the chapter of the cave in the Qur'an. Maybe the Meccans considered um, the Cape Muslims to be so far away, to be like in a cave or to be in a distant place, and they called them Ahlul Kahf. And um, they came into Mecca, and they uh, uh, made the pilgrimage and settled down in Arabia. Later on, during um, the colonial period, where Muslims were involved in uh, uh, being artisans and semi-skilled labor, they became excellent tailors. So they made excellent suits and excellent clothing to the point where the ones who were able to go to the pilgrimage to Mecca uh, and they uh, started to sew clothing for the people of Mecca, they became the tailors of the Ashraf, Ashraf <coughs> the tailors of the sultans, and they uh, lived in Mecca and they intermarried with the people uh, in that region. So they make a, a vibrant community. And what develops from the apartheid is a negative and a positive. The negative is that Muslims are separated from other people and <clears throat> they are oppressed by a, a strong racial regime. But the positive is that Muslims are forced to come together to live in collectives. And this forms a type of mini-Islamic state. So within the regions, especially in Cape Town, where you come into the Muslim sections, you find the Adhan being called openly, uh, all of the shops are selling halal food, um, the women are dressing according to Islam, uh, children are playing around and, and they are mostly Muslims. And so it, it is a strange phenomenon that happens. Muslims are forced together, but through coming together in a state of Islam, they are able to actually preserve their faith and to raise themselves to a higher level. So what develops out of this is that within the 20th century, Muslims then come to Cairo, they come to Medina and Mecca, and they start to uh, learn to read the Qur'an. What develops out of this is a type of qira'a. It is a level of the recitation of the Qur'an that becomes world class. And some of the great uh, uh, hufaz coming out of Egypt, um, some of the greatest of the Quran readers would go down to the Cape and read for the people in the Cape and they would involve themselves in Quranic competitions and this continues up until today to the level of the people of the Cape is one that is recognized by people throughout the planet. Also the struggle, because the history of, Cape, of the Cape is one of struggle, the struggle then is, 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 is recognized not only within South Africa, but without South Africa. 
So Muslims from the Cape also are very much involved in the issues within the Muslim world. And they have a very powerful voice. And although their number is small, uh, their voice is heard uh, throughout the world. So um, this culture of the Cape uh, is, a, is a beautiful blending. And the, the, the Cape Tonians, who are known as Malays, the terminology is using Malay, but actually it is a beautiful blending of Asian, uh, of African, of Indian, um, of Turkish, all types of blood, of European, all types of blood uh, are mixed together within the Cape Tonian community. And also, different foods are found within their culture. So again, it is another beautiful blending of the cultures of the world. And, and, and that is one of the great blessings um, that Islam has uh, for the world. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was surrounded by people of all nationalities. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not submit to Arab nationalism, but taught that the best amongst the Muslims is the one who has faith. It is not based upon the color of your skin, nor is it based upon your class or your lineage. So the Muslims of the Cape continue in this tradition, and they are able to build over 150 masjids within Cape Town and its vicinity itself. They are also able to export their uh, Quran readers around South Africa, around the Southern Hemisphere, and they are being benefited from in many parts of the Muslim world today. This is part of the legacy of struggle. And from the early times, uh, Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, uh, Tuan Guru, and all those who were struggling to maintain the Arabic language, those who would get up in the middle of the night and perform tahajjud prayer, those who would read the Quran even though they were tortured to the point of death. It is through this struggle that Islam uh, continues and thrives and that Muslims are able to participate in the struggles of other people in other parts of the world. And so um, we again open up this gem uh, of wisdom, an untold story of Islam, an untold story of world history. I leave you with this in peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.